The two most powerful at the time, the two most powerful members of the PMO didn't care about the rule of law. What does that say about the integrity of the Justin Trudeau government? There is none. Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. We recently sat down with Larry Brock, the Conservative Member of Parliament for Brantford Brant, to dig into new revelations about the SNC-Lavalin scandal. Mr. Brock was very candid with his answers to our questions, and we learned a lot during this discussion. So without further ado, let's get into it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brock, for joining Northern Perspective again. We're really happy to have you. Happy to be here. We're going to be focusing um, this discussion all around SNC, um, and it's it's interesting that SNC Lavalin has kind of reared its head because I think the Liberals, and frankly many Canadians, thought that this was never going to come up again. But um, I imagine um, this really started to, I would say, make its way back into the the public eye last summer when uh, Democracy Watch published their. Uh, access to information request that the RCMP still had the investigation open. So is that, um, would, would you say that's accurate? Still, in my view, Cypher, thank you for that question, um, still um, confused by that particular statement. Um, we felt that that would give us grounds to re-interview uh, some of the key players, obviously the, uh, the investigator for the RCMP, the commissioner, for the RCMP, and it was a, um, as a difficult process, to say the least, to finally get them to testify. But when they did testify most recently, the RCMP commissioner and the lead investigator both confirmed, uh, not in relation to the statement that they gave to Democracy Watch, but both confirmed that uh, they had gone to the end of the road in terms of their investigation. They didn't identify when that event took place, they certainly uh, articulated the reasons behind that, and I want to get into that uh, during this interview. But I think what's important to note for our viewers is that Democracy Watch only received one half of the material that they had requested, which really begs the question, why didn't you give it all at the same time? What are you holding back? Um, in my view, my spidey sense as a former prosecutor seems to suggest that there was a path forward to move this into charging Justin Trudeau. Um, but I don't think there was a political will for that, which begs again the commentary that I receive on a regular basis from um, people who support me right across this country, is that there is indeed a two-tier level of justice when it comes to investigating and ultimately charging any and all political figures, but especially the Prime Minister. So the Deputy Commissioner made it abundantly clear that no one in this country, including the Prime Minister, is above the law. Allegedly. All right? But when I suggested to him, hypothetically of course, Sir, if you had reasonable and probable grounds, which is the key legal test for all law enforcement to charge as low as spray painting a building all the way to multiple homicides. A police officer must have reasonable and probable grounds to lay a charge. And I said to the deputy, if you had reasonable and probable grounds to arrest Justin Trudeau, our current prime minister, for a criminal offense without identifying what it was, would you proceed accordingly? had a hard time answering that question. Yes, he did. And of course, I had a lot of uh, blowback from uh, the Liberal and NDP members at committee because I think it was a valid question and it really telegraphs, in my view, um, where the police should be very resoundly stating, absolutely yes, the Prime Minister should be treated no differently than any other member of the Canadian public. But clearly in this case, he did, and I'm gonna explain why. And is there, 
you know, one of the things that we've talked about on, on our show when we were covering uh, that in committee for, uh, for the viewers is uh, if, if I were to put myself into the, I would say, into the shoes of the RCMP when they were investigating this, um, do you think, since you've done this as a profession before, do you think it would give them trepidation um, in terms of the amount of evidence that they had uh, in terms of pursuing a charge for a prime minister versus a typical Canadian on the street. Do you think, um, do you think that made them nervous? Do you think that, um, that they, <laughs> they would only want to proceed if they had, they, they almost had the, the maximum threshold of proof, uh, for actually, you know, convicting somebody in a trial versus pursuing a charge because they wouldn't want to be that sure. And again, that is not their bailiwick. And I put that to the commissioner, if you recall. I said, we all have jurisdictional lanes in a criminal process. And there's a prosecutor, there's a judge, there's an investigator. And at the investigative stage, that is the lowest rung of burden of proof. As I've indicated, reasonable, and probable grounds is a very, very low standard. But the spokesperson, and forgive me if I, if I forget the name of the spokesperson for the RCMP, in uh, numerous um, articles I read on a national scale, uh, conflated the standard of proof at the investigative stage with what the prosecution needs to prove and ultimately what a judge would do to establish a finding of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And that should never, ever uh, confuse a police officer because that is not their responsibility. And when I pushed the commissioner on that, he did not give me an appropriate response. And of course, as you know, Cypher, um, all our rounds are very time limited and it really didn't give me an opportunity to do some more pushback. But that's a lingering question that is really concerning to me. For sure. The RCMP Commissioner Michael Duhem said that there was a long delay in actually closing the investigation due to, quote unquote, internal matters that have been addressed. What's your response to that? Don't know what that means. Internal matters within the RCMP, internal matters within the Liberal government. What are we supposed to decipher from that? Uh, in my view, and I put this again to him rather rhetorically, that I've seen homicide cases investigated, charged, prosecuted, and sentenced in less amount of time than the RCMP has spent investigating Justin Trudeau for obstruction of justice under Section 139, Sub 2. Inexcusable delay. So this is going to be a, this is a meaty question, um, but I think this goes into some of the particular items that you want to get into uh, in this discussion. So um, not directly related to SNC-Lavalin, but during the Ethics Committee meeting on February 27th, um, Michael Barrett presented a decision tree from paragraph 121.1c of the criminal code under, quote, frauds on the government, end quote, via an ATIP request, which was related to the Aga Khan scandal. It's by the RCMP, and they've populated information on the document. It asks a series of questions with respect to Justin Trudeau's visit to the Aga Khan Island, Bells Cay. Was Mr. Trudeau a government official at the time? And it says, yes. Did Mr. Trudeau accept a benefit from the Aga Khan? It says, yes. Did the Aga Khan have dealings with the government? It says, yes. Then it says, did Mr. Trudeau have consent in writing of the head of a branch of government for whom he worked? It says, unknown. At that point, it says, if yes, then the final verdict would be not guilty. But it goes on, if no, did Mr. Trudeau know that he accepted was a benefit from a person who had dealings with the government? Yes. And then if yes, it says, final verdict, guilty of fraud on the government. Looking at that and looking at what has frankly not happened in the SNC-Lavalin case. In your opinion, what is going on with the RCMP as it relates to Justin Trudeau and what seems to be that two-tier justice system in this country that you've talked about? I don't know. Um, they've used justification behind their inability to obtain cabinet confidences 
and the inability for the government to waive solicitor client privilege. Now, those are two important keystones in, a, in a, any democracy, but particularly in relation to these matters. But one thing I don't think viewers have actually been made aware of, uh, Michael Warnock, when he, most, when he testified most recently, made it abundantly clear that the issue surrounding the, not, I'm going to use the words that he used, the discussion, the discussion regarding the deferred prosecution agreement over the course of the four months, that never made it to the cabinet table. So where is the cabinet confidences if that level of discussion, I would deem pressure, over that four months was not bound by cabinet confidences? And furthermore, he made it abundantly clear that Jody Wilson-Raybould in the dual role that she had as AG and Minister of Justice was never giving Justin Trudeau legal advice. So again, it begs the question, the evidence was always there right in front of the nose of the RCMP all along. They didn't need cabinet confidences. They didn't need a waiver of privilege. But even if they did, I put this to the commissioner, why did you not exercise the police tools that you have that you automatically utilize in 99% of all the investigations. That's going to a court, going to a judge, making application for a search warrant, making application for a production order. Despite collecting reams of evidence, including evidence from the Ethics Commissioner and testimony from Jody Wilson-Raybould at committee, why didn't the RCMP exercise its absolute statutory right under the Criminal Code of Canada to obtain a production order and or search warrant from a justice to obtain those cabinet documents. His response was, well, I didn't think it was going to be successful. I didn't think that we had the threshold. Now, when you talk about thresholds, again, if I had more time, I would have explored this. When we talk about that low threshold of reasonable and probable grounds, it's even less in terms of making application for a warrant. You only have to have a reasonable belief that a crime has been committed. A reasonable belief in spite of all the evidence that was right in front of their nose. They had the transcript of the committee hearing from Jody Wilson-Raybould. They had the transcript of some of her um, political staffers who testified. They interviewed Jody Wilson-Raybould. They interviewed the staffers, the evidence was right there all along. So when you take a look at the thresholds, when you take a look at the avenues they had to obtain evidence, when you take a look at this, again, smoke and mirror from the government, we have to hang on and preserve our cabinet confidences and solicitor and client privilege, which had no application in this case, it then begs the question, why did you not pursue this? Because, sir, there was no political will or capital to ever, for the first time in Canadian history, to charge uh, a sitting prime minister with a criminal offense, notwithstanding he's not above the law. I'll let your viewers determine that. And even dovetailing off of that, um, I think, at least from what we've seen so far, the most important piece of evidence that, that we've reviewed is the the recorded phone call from Michael Wernick and Jody Wilson-Raybould. And in the uh, the recent committee meeting with Mr. Wernick, um, I believe it was Michael Cooper who referenced the events that happened the day before that conversation took place, where Katie Telford and um, uh, Gerald Butts met with uh, Jody, Jody Wilson-Raybould's chief of staff and essentially said, uh, we're done with all of the legal stuff. This needs to stop. And then the following day, this phone call happens. Thank goodness she recorded it. Do you think that is the smoking gun in this whole situation? The two most powerful at the time, the two most powerful members of the PMO didn't care about the rule of law 
What does that say about the integrity of the Justin Trudeau government? There is none. They didn't care what the legalities were. Justin Trudeau, according to uh, Michael Wernick, was in that type of mood. He is going to get this deal done one way or another. And if you didn't follow the rules, clearly reading between the lines, there were going to be consequences. And the consequences were she lost her job. Canada's first female Indigenous Attorney General lost her job because she had the courage to do her job and say no to political pressures exerted by Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister's office, the Clerk of the Privy Council, and other members. It's disgusting. What would need to happen in order to task the Ontario Provincial Police to begin an investigation into the SNC-Lavalin affair? It's as simple as writing a letter, inviting them to consider um, basically picking up where the RCMP left off or starting afresh. Um, they have the mandate to say no. They have the mandate to agree. But ultimately, that will be a decision made by our leader uh, and his uh, leadership team. It's above my pay grade. Um, I will certainly be supportive of that, and I will be more than happy to share my thoughts uh, with the leader and the team to help them frame an appropriate decision as to whether or not that's the appropriate route to take. I'm just profoundly disappointed. I'm sure as many viewers are across this country viewing or learning or just knowing about the SNC, watching what happened over the last couple of weeks, watching this podcast, they have to be profoundly disappointed in the exercise of policing by our National Police Service. Well, and, and they, they are, and I'm sure you hear it um, from your constituents. I'm sure you hear it in, in constituents in other writings, uh, rallies you've attended. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of Canadians that are, are frankly losing hope uh, because they don't feel accountability exists anymore. Um, you know, we, we spoke a little bit about uh, accountability with regard to the, the Liberal government um, in, in our last discussion. Uh, Mr. Jenis brought up that the ultimate accountability is an election. But uh, I do want to say that for many Canadians, that isn't their view of what ultimate accountability is, especially when you have blatant criminal offenses uh, that people should be charged for, uh, like Justin Trudeau. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do we say to those Canadians? Because the entire system is not broken. Um, it, it, there's pieces of it that I think need, need to be addressed. Uh, but I, I, would, I would hazard to say, and evidence of that being that we just recently saw that the, uh, a liberal appointed judge overturned the view of the Emergencies Act. So the system can still work. So what, what is a message to Canadians that are frankly losing hope in the, in the entire system? Well, I don't know if I touched upon this. Uh, I can't remember exactly what I said during our last interview, but one of the reasons why I chose to leave a very comfortable lifestyle working with the Ontario Crown Attorneys Association was this whole concept of a lack of trust. There's been a broken trust for many, many years. And that really bothered me because I grew up at a time where politicians were revered. They were influential. They were the leaders of the community, bringing forth the voices uh, to government and, and affecting change. And when you just read and hear examples of what's been going on literally over the last eight years by this government, they talk a good game. They can't walk the walk. They talk about accountability. They talk about consequences. Arrive Can is a classic example. If we equate what has been happening in the Arrive Can fiasco, if we equate that to what could have happened in the private sector under similar circumstances, there would have been such intense backlash if this were a publicly traded private company. The CEO would have been forced to resign. People would have been terminated on the spot. Police would have been called in. An active investigation would have happened almost immediately. And only after, what, I've been involved in the ArriveCan scandal now for almost three, four months, 
we finally get the RCMP commissioner to confirm yesterday that they're now investigating? You know, timing is bad here. The writing has been on the wall. Yeah. So to your question, what can I say to Canadians? Have faith. I am going to push for accountability and transparency. I'm a solution-oriented member of parliament. I don't view myself as a typical politician who will give you word salad and make a promise and under-deliver. I look for solutions. When in my, and in my former role as a prosecutor, I had an issue, I had a problem, I looked for solutions, I delivered results. We are not getting results in a timely basis by our current federal government. I know we can do better at a conservative majority government led by our next great prime minister, Pierre Polyev, will do exactly that. So I say to Canadians, have faith. We will deliver. Hypothetically, let's say you weren't in the Conservative Party right now, and instead you were part of the Liberal government. Given what's going on with the Prime Minister, what would you do? Interesting scenario. Um, could happen to me once we form government. There may be an issue, there may be a position taken. Uh, by my leader and the leadership team that runs contrary to my ethical standards uh, or um, my position on a particular issue. I would hope that the leader, as he already has demonstrated, an ability to have an open door discussion with members of his caucus. And if position were taken that I really had a problem with, he'd be the first person I'd want to talk to and have that frank discussion. Uh, as you know, we often get whipped into a position. There's three levels of whipping. Uh, ultimately, free votes on matters generally reserved for conscious level uh, public policy issues. Uh, we've had a few of those in the last two and a half years. So again, without being specific, uh, Cypher, all I can say is as, as a member who lives true to his core values of integrity, and transparency, and accountability, uh, if I had a fundamental difference uh, with my leader, I wouldn't bury my issue in the sand. I would want to deal with it right up front, have that tough discussion with the leader in the hopes that an impasse uh, can be brokered. So given what you know now about the investigation, uh, the government's ability to withhold evidence uh, from a criminal investigation, and Michael Wernick's own flippant remarks that if you don't like it, change the law, as it relates to cabinet confidence, do you think a conservative government should and will change the laws in the future to prevent a sitting prime minister from hiding behind cabinet confidence as it relates to a criminal investigation? I certainly hope so. If we're going to live true to our motto of transparency and accountability, then I think that is a step in the right direction. No one is above the law. At this point, um, is, there, is there something that, is there an aspect of this investigation? Is there information that maybe Canadians don't know or an issue that you haven't been able to explore a committee that you you want to tell the tens of thousands of Canadians out there, the millions of Canadians out there that watch our show, uh, you think that they need to know? Well, I think the, the most obvious uh, aspect of that is how can, in, in all good conscience, can the commissioner of our National Police Service claim that his service did a complete and thorough investigation when they interviewed four people the Ethics Commissioner interviewed 14 people. I don't know if, uh, if you picked up on it, Cypher, or whether Canadians picked up on it, but I really pushed this as hard as I could within the time I had remaining on the legal elements of obstruction of justice. In any criminal offense, if I got time to, to explain, in any criminal offense, again, from spray painting, shoplifting, to homicide, a police officer, and also ultimately the Crown Attorney, to prove the case must have two elements. 
the actus reus, these are Latin phrases, and the mens rea. The actus reus is the act itself. So in this particular case, we've got evidence, uncontroverted evidence, I might add, because not only were portions of that evidence, as you've indicated, were recorded, that Joey Wilson Raybould was the only participant in this sorry saga who actually took contemporaneous notes. So you can understand why the Prime Minister wouldn't want to take notes. You can understand why the PMO wouldn't want to take notes. And you can certainly understand in the circumstances why Michael Warnock would, want to, would, would not want to take notes. But Jody Wilson-Raybould had the foresight to realize this looked and smelled very bad and she needed to exercise her due diligence and she made ex just extraordinary notes about the Sori saga. So going back to the Actus Reis, we had four months worth of uh, examples of pressure after pressure of numerous players I just identified reaching out directly to Jody Wilson-Raybould, her chief of staff, other members of, uh, of her office, again, pressuring her with details about SNC-Lavalin, which were a lie. For instance, SNC had signed a covenant to obtain financing, which required them not to move their headquarters outside of Quebec for a period of time, which I believe doesn't expire until 2025. The Prime Minister lied, his proxies lied to her, and sounded this as if this, this inability to give it a, a deferred prosecution agreement is going to result in the company moving from Canada to the UK, and hence a loss of 7,000 jobs. An absolute lie. Well, and having worked in the private sector, um, uh, it, it's also come to light that didn't they also sign a 20-year lease for the uh, the building that they were actually in? Millions of dollars worth of reservations. And a, and a capital organization is not going to walk away from an investment they like that. They are not. And then ultimately, of course, after after all this has been exposed, the CEO of SNC Lavalin and confirmed we've already known. They weren't moving. They never were going to move. There were no job losses. It would have been helpful if they made that known to Canadians at the time, but obviously they had an interest in the uh, deferred prosecution agreement. So not only was that a lie, but the Prime Minister was exerting his own influence and advancing his own interests in compelling the Attorney General to change her mind. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought headquarters were in Justin Trudeau's own writing, a Papineau. He made it abundantly clear to her in one of the discussions, don't you forget, not only am I the Prime Minister, who has to be concerned about jobs, but I'm also the member of Papineau. So we have a Quebec election. I'm the member of Papineau. I'm filling you with all these lies about job losses. And it was repeated over and over and over again for four months when Joey Wilson Rabel, over those four months, made it abundantly clear, don't pressure me. This is getting dangerous. You're crossing the line. Don't do it. I've made up my mind. I'm not going to interfere. They actually engaged retired justices from the Supreme Court of Canada in the hopes that she could be guided by their legal opinion that she was actually doing the right thing. The right thing was standing true to her position as the Attorney General and the rule of law and not to be pressured by the Prime Minister. So the acts of obstructing justice was made up without getting the cabinet confidences, without waiving solicitor-client privilege. Now, on the issue of mens rea, the mens rea requires a specific intent to do the act, which would result in an obstruction of justice. The law is very clear. You don't have to be successful in your attempts. An attempt itself can be satisfied under the criminal code. So I labored with this whole concept of intent, because the facts in and of itself, in my view as a former prosecutor, impute intent just by the relentless nature and the self-serving interests 
of the prime minister, an argument could be made by me that there was a specific intent. But it was also um, interesting. It was also interesting to read, and I didn't read the full Trudeau to Dion report until a few days before Michael Wernick had testified, and uh, a few days again before uh, our former ethics commissioner, Mr. Dion, and our current ethics commissioner testify, which I believe was last week. And I pointed out to him that very same concern. And I forget the paragraph number, but you know it's all on uh, it's all on tape right now. Um, where I asked the question, I say, you use in your phrase that Justin Trudeau knowingly exerted pressure by doing A, B, and C. I said, when I review that from a legal perspective, knowingly is another word for saying you did so with intent. You did so with purpose. It wasn't an accidental type of communication that you had with Jody Wilson-Rabel. Let's face it, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you right now if there was only one set of communications between the Prime Minister and Jody Wilson-Rabel. It's the cumulative impact and the analysis done by the Ethics Commissioner where he felt, now his view was different, while well, his actually legal counsel had a bit of a exchange with me saying, well, I don't know if that rises to the level of mens rea, Mr. Brock, because I was unable, and they have a mandate, as you know, that if they suspect, not word number one, I'm just misphrasing that, it's not suspect, if they had reasonable grounds, I think is their, is their uh, threshold, if they have reasonable grounds to believe there was criminality, they had to stop their investigation and turn matters over to the RCMP. They didn't do so, so I pushed uh, the former commissioner and his counsel as to why, given that particular conclusion and analysis, why that didn't rise to uh, the mandate to turn matters over to the RCMP. And his lawyer basically said, well, my understanding of that section of the criminal code, section 139 sub 2, we have to establish a corrupt intent. And I didn't have a chance to expand what he meant by corrupt intent. A corrupt intent, in my view, just means where a person such as Justin Trudeau has an ulterior motive to change the position of the Attorney General. It was a selfish move on his part. He lied to her by presenting false facts, allowed his proxies to lie to her, and ultimately he lied to Canadians when confronted by the release of the Globe and Mail story by Robert Fife. He looked Canadians in the eyes by looking in the camera and basically saying the story was false. Right. We know that was an absolute lie. And then he turned around and apologized apologized. Quote unquote. <laughs> Quote unquote. Yeah. And ultimately, his response to the actual conclusions of the Dion report is he takes responsibility for the mistakes that he made. Now, that's a partial admission of liability. But again, he's famous for his word salad, not accepting the all the content of the report, but responsible for the actions that I took and the mistakes that I made is by no means a mea culpa. He is by no means accepting full responsibility, which unfortunately is the pattern for this prime minister. Well, and on that on that statement from the legal counsel um, that he didn't have a corrupt intent, so in my interpretation of that, call it corrupt, call it uncorrupt, the fact is, is that he still was interfering within... A, a ongoing investigation into SNC level. He was still interfering within the justice process by mm -hmm. trying to influence um, uh, Jody Wilson Raybould or not. It, it, it actually, to me, it doesn't even matter the reason why. It's that the fact that he was doing it and he intended on doing it. So, yeah. uh, it, it, does that does that jive with your? It, it, it does. Yeah. And, and I said, I said to uh, to both Michael Duhame. Uh, at the end of the meeting, and I said also to uh, Mr. Dion, as we exited the uh, the committee room, I said, you know, as a former prosecutor, and let's face it, they received legal advice 
literally within hours after Jody Wilson-Raybould testified at the Justice Committee, they were on the phone the very next morning with an Ottawa Crown attorney. Given that they launched an investigation, I can only conclude that a green light was given by a Crown attorney that this rises to the level of criminality that you should be investigating. So I was able to review that during the first round of disclosures that Democracy Watch received. But who knows what, what other type of evidence is out there that they did not want Canadians to review. Um, but you're right. It's not, if it wasn't a hard, still to my view, still not a hard prosecution for any Crown attorney across this country uh, to continue with. The elements are there, both actus reus and mens rea. Just taking Joey Wilson Raybould's evidence alone, that in my view would be sufficient to continue a prosecution. Well, and you're not the only. But you can't continue a prosecution <laughs> when there is no charge. Yeah. Well, and you're not the only former Crown prosecutor with that opinion. One of our viewers uh, um, is a big fan of yours, and she's a former Crown prosecutor for uh, the Northwest Territories. She okay. has the exact same opinion in that there was more than enough uh, evidence, and she even herself said, I would have loved to prosecute that. And not only Crown attorneys are saying that, uh, Cypher, I've, I've been hearing from defense counsel as well. Wow. Who well, actually say, say, yeah, there was sufficient evidence. Evidence here. So there you go. That's quite telling. So lastly, we wanted to ask a question on the record that we didn't get to uh, from our interview last week. So if an election were to happen today, all current committee investigations would be terminated. Will the Conservatives commit to resume these investigations to demonstrate government transparency, accountability, and earn the trust of Canadians again? Absolutely. Again, I can't speak on behalf of the leader, but I know that I have an opinion as to so many loose threads that need to be fully pulled on all kinds of scandals. So yes, you're absolutely right. Whether we have an election or whether he prorogues parliament, it is going to shut down all the good work that we are doing to expose the corruption and the illegal acts, in my view, of this particular government and the bureaucracy. So again, without speaking squarely and uh, definitively on behalf of uh, our leader and the leadership team, I will certainly be pushing, championing that we continue that, we reestablish that, because it'll be our position that Canadians deserve a true, transparent, and accountable government. Well, and I think um, I think it's in the best interest of a new Conservative government to do that, because otherwise these issues will still remain. The, these especially when uh, around to the contracting process, when mm -hmm. it comes to a rive scam, uh, when it comes to what's going on with the SDT slush fund, when mm -hmm. it comes uh, around to the the skeletons in the closet of SNC Lavalin, all of those questions will still remain. And it will, uh, in, in my opinion, it will just hang over a new conservative government uh, if these issues aren't dealt with. Do you mm -hmm. agree? Absolutely, I agree. Most assuredly. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time, sir. You've been very generous with us. And uh, uh, Canadians, I'm sure, are are going to be very interested to hear this this talk. And you have a lot of support out there from coast to coast. Um, yourself, the, the Conservative Party. Um, we, we brand Northern Perspective as a, a program that's based around platform, not party. Um, and... Uh, you know, we align ourselves to common sense, which is where I think, you know, why we seem to think that the Conservative Party is is going to be the appropriate party to take over this, this country, to heal the divides with Canadians and restore trust in this government that we haven't had for a long, long a time. A very long time. So, Couldn't agree more.